So tell me a little bit about your thing. Are you? I'm the supervisor for AMLC in Mexico oh, for all financial systems. Oh my God. Yeah, you okay. gonna start us off? I'm just gonna tell people that you're about to start us off. Okay. <laughs> oh, Mike's live. All right, good. All right, so yeah, we're gonna get started with uh, our afternoon panels, and delighted to introduce to you Russ Jones, uh, chair of the Border Trade Alliance, who will be moderated for this first session. Thanks. All right, everyone. Uh, as the uh, first event after lunch, I probably should make us all stand up and do a few jumping jacks and deep breaths and stay awake. But obviously, from the empty seats, some people didn't quite uh, make it. They must be exercising outside. So if we can get the door closed, because uh, when earlier I was sitting back there and it was kind of noisy and sometimes hard to hear the uh, panelists. So if you see these empty seats up front, I suggested to Chris that maybe if we turn the microphones off, people would migrate forward. But uh, I insisted we keep this on for the recording purposes. My name is Russ Jones. I'm uh, currently the chairman of the Border Trade Alliance. Um, been a member of the Border Ch Trade Alliance since its inception. Actually, uh, I mentioned this to James Clark with the Smart Border Coalition. We actually started in San Diego and then kind of migrated along the border uh, as an organization. But uh, very proud to be part of this organization and all the fine work it, uh, it does. Uh, I'm very uh, pleased at our, our partnership with the Wilson, Woodrow Wilson Center and what we've been able to do over the last several years and hopefully for uh, many years to, to come. The, um, my, professionally, I'm a customs broker and international freight forwarder, our company R.L. Jones Customs Brokers. We have offices all along the U.S.-Mexico border from San Diego to uh, uh, McAllen and, uh, and see 
pretty much uh, all of what happens on the border and in terms of international trade. Um, we are involved in logistics and trucking and, and, and so we work on both sides of the border. So in addition to being that, we're small business in each of those communities along the border. And of course, uh, like everyone else, we require banking services and financial services in order to do what we do, as do many of the small to medium-sized businesses along the border who, who they're either their clients or their products come from one country or the other. They have need to exchange uh, currencies from dollars to pesos. They need to be able to do wire transfers and, and do business in, in an unrestricted environment. Uh, unfortunately, since Dodd-Frank um, and the banking crisis uh, of the Great uh, Recession, I guess that's what we're calling it now, and the, uh, and the passage of Dodd-Frank, uh, with its additional requirements that uh, bear on the BSA, the Bank uh, Security uh, Act, and the AML, the Anti-Money Laundering Act, it's created a situation over a period of time where we're seeing this phenomena of, of bank de-risking. And strictly in the case of the banks, as, uh, as you'll see, in many cases, it's a business decision that they're making based on their, their stockholders and their bottom line, what they have to do. Unfortunately, the unintended consequences of Dodd-Frank has having, in some cases, in my opinion, just the opposite effect, where we were so worried about banks that were too big to fail, we're now ensuring that small banks are failing or getting out of these uh, the business, particularly with respect to the border, where they... Theoretically, this money laundering, people just assume that because it's on the border, that's where all the money laundering. Well, money moves around the world at a very high velocity through many, many countries and not just the border. But the impacts, the unintended consequences of this are being particularly uh, felt on the border. Um, this, uh, the panel we have uh, today, uh, which is Border Banking, How to Prevent Money Laundering While Facilitating Commerce and and financial inclusion. Wonder if that's an oxymoron. <laughs> but um, but we'll try. But we have a really interesting panel in that we have three three individuals that represent very distinct, different perspectives on the border uh, banking issue. We we have uh, Jose Luis Stein. He's vice president, uh, supervisor of Prevention Processes, National Banking and Securities Commission of Mexico. Uh, if you look at his resume, it's uh, he's had an illustrious uh, career in law and banking, and was uh, uh, involved with the International <coughs> Monetary Fund and uh, other uh, agencies in Mexico. So he brings us that perspective of Mexico, and they're watching, they're cooperating, they're working with the U.S. on these issues with their with their traditional banking partners in the U.S. But in some cases, they're somewhat po they're obviously powerless to affect what's going on regulatorily in the U.S. They have their own regulatory regime in Mexico to deal with, but maybe there are some answers, and we'll see. We'll try to find out, and and hopefully uh, uh, Jose Luis can uh, enlighten us on that. Uh, we next have uh, Leah Marquez Peterson, president of the Tucson Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, uh, one of the largest chambers, if not the largest chamber of commerce. In, uh, in Arizona, they have 1,800 members. Um, she's also a very successful uh, small business owner herself, and, uh, and uh, I, I think the majority of her clientele are small to medium businesses. So she'll bring us that perspective of what, what it's like uh, anecdotally for these small businesses to, do, to transact business and be successful uh, in a border environment within the border banking environment we have right now. And then finally, uh, Hector Serna, president and CEO, of International Bank of Commerce in Eagle Pass, Texas. Uh, he is also on the board of directors for the Border Trade Alliance, and he's the uh, chairman of our task force for Border Trade Alliance on border banking. And so he's taking a leadership position as we work with uh, uh, people like uh, Congressman Flake, I mean, excuse me, Senator Flake and other congressmen along and senators along the border that are, are hearing from their constituents about these, uh, these issues. So we're trying to respond as an organization uh, to that. And he will bring you that perspective of the, the, the business case for either both the de-risking and the impacts on his institution on the border in order to stay in business and provide uh, biz uh, services to their clientele. And so with that, I'm going to ask each of them to take about five minutes to just kind of lay their case out. And what I'm hoping to do is to have more of a conversation between the four of us and on issues, a little give and take, and, um, and so that each of us can actually ask each other questions 
uh, not just myself, and then we'll open it up to all, to you all for uh, some Q&A a little bit later on. So, Hector, if you'd uh, lead off, you're the first in line here. Sure. Thank you, Russ, and good afternoon. Before we get started, I would like to congratulate uh, both Chris um, and Duncan for all their work that they do, and really thank them for working with with BTA on this uh, on this wonderful conference. But uh, Russ, you've really hit the nail on the head. I mean, it, the the uh, Dodd Frank Act was something that devastated banks, and I think most everyone in the room uh, may know a little bit about that. But I'll give you a little bit more detail in terms of what has happened since 2010 when the Dodd Frank Act was uh, uh, came into law and. And it's a 20,000-page act that became law. It's uh, one of those uh, wonderful issues that gets passed without really anybody reading it. But there are some things that impacted uh, the, the banking industry, particularly um, those of us on the border. Um, we live and breathe small business and support uh, small communities along the U.S.-Mexico border. And in in as much as our uh, company is concerned, uh, we started off uh, about 50 years ago on the Laredo, Texas, Nuevo Laredo border and uh, grew from a $40 million bank to a $12 billion regional uh, company with uh, branches in Texas and Oklahoma. Uh, the concentration is, is, is on the Texas-Mexico border and, and really um, our, our over 30 percent of our customer base is is uh, from Mexico. This Dodd Frank Act and some of the things that have escalated uh, are um, the compliance matters and and really the the uh, knowing your customer rules have really uh, escalated to to an, a, a level that has never been seen and and it's truly impossible for us to. Uh, to know not only our customers but our customers' customer, and that's really why you're seeing some of this de-risking, where, uh, which is a key word today. Uh, it's not only de-risking as much as not being able to uh, to conduct an enhanced due diligence on your customer, and to understanding where the source of wealth is, and understanding where the source of funds are coming to open accounts or merely to deposit into accounts. Uh, some banks, as you mentioned, the strategy is such that they decide uh, to close down shop. Well, obviously, our strategy is very, very different. We're a highly compliant bank, and it's cost a tremendous amount of uh, resources. Uh, Fifteen years, I've been in the industry almost 30 years, and 15 with, uh, with IBC, and we probably had one or two individuals 15 years ago, and post Dodd Frank uh, that we're working on compliance uh, matters and uh, we're up to a staff of almost 60 people. It's a, an incredible uh, you know, $5 million budget that uh, uh, for folks that are just compliance uh, motivated. But there are things as uh, called HIFCA and HITTA that you may not have heard, but uh, those of us that live on the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, the U.S. government considers us to be in a HIFCA, and that's a high-intensity financial crime area. So that gives us uh, uh, it, it, it gives us a um, a lot more attention, if you will. We go to conferences throughout the country, and and uh, there's no question that we're getting more um, more scrutiny than than other banks that are not on the U.S.-Mexico border. It doesn't happen on the U.S.-Canadian border, and we have to uh, pay a heck of a lot more attention and make sure that. Uh, that we're that we not only know our customer, we know our customers' customers, and and we're actually uh, audited and and and, uh, and and must comply. So what have we done? Um, aside from HIFCA, there's also a HITTA, which is the high intensity drug trafficking areas, and and those are also included on the on the U.S. Mexico border. So we get we get both. It's a it's a double whammy. So we're under a microscope. Financial institutions, banks in particular that are that operate on the U.S.-Mexico border are under a microscope. Now, how does that make it more difficult? <coughs> You've had some uh, business decisions and strategies from some banks that have decided to simply close shop because they cannot comply or won't commit the resources to comply uh, with with the different regulations. Uh, in our case, it's very different. Thirty percent of our customers are from Mexico. And we are we pride ourselves on being a, a highly compliant bank. Uh, we, we've devoted the resources and, and committed the dollars to, to make sure that that we can give our customers that um, 
the, the service that they deserve and the products that they deserve. You know, we, we, um, we, we pride ourselves that notwithstanding the fact that we're a $12 billion regional company, we are divided into 12 different regions, and each different region uh, is, is like an independent unit and that makes independent decisions. And we consider ourselves in community banks where we take part in the communities in which we operate. We belong to the local chambers. We belong to the local organizations. Uh, we participate and, and, and contribute and make sure uh, not because CRA uh, uh, obliges us to participate, but we do it because we, we community want to. Re community Reinvestment Act. Community right? Reinvestment Act, correct. Uh, we do it because we, it's the right thing to do. So mm -hmm. we, we do participate. When larger institutions um, have a wholesale approach to closing branches along the, uh, the U.S.-Mexico border, we lose that. And I, and I think Leo will be talking a little bit about that as well in terms of the challenges. But um, yes, understanding your customers, doing enhanced due diligence, we, um, we definitely, de definitely have made the commitment. One of the things that, that that's a highlight and, and based on, on the topic of discussion today is uh, uh, anti-money laundering is that there are accounts that are, um, that are considered high risk and basically if it's a foreign account, the federal government considers it high risk. Um, if if it's a politically exposed person, i.e. someone who's either held foreign officer or, or is a uh, current office holder, that's a high risk account. Um, <laughs> and and it's Having just, been one of those, uh, I can understand why you do that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you handle uh, aircraft sales or if you are a money services business, so some of these larger banks have decided, you know, we're just not going to, uh, we're not going to devote the level of resources because their their branches on the U.S.-Mexico border are so small relative to the big overall picture that they decide to close them. Obviously, we we won't do that, and we're uh, we've elected to dedicate the resources. We, we we're a highly compliant organization, and 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 we're there for the customers. So uh, we, um, you know, it's a changing environment. Uh, we believe that uh, uh, that Dodd Frank has really hurt banks in general, and particularly on the on the U.S. Mexico border. In 2010, we had over 9,700 banks. We're down to like 90, excuse me, 7,200 banks, and we're down by 1,600 charters. Hmm. Uh, oh. That is a tremendous amount. We're losing one bank a day. One commercial bank a day. Not counting branches. Branches are down significantly as well. Uh, there's, there's some statistics about, um, and, and uh, I said since Dodd Frank, actually since 2006, in the last 10 years we've lost, uh, you know, 1,600, 1600 banks. Uh, in terms of branches, although the mega banks, the larger banks that are from $10 billion to $100 billion or in excess of $100 billion, that's billion with a B, uh, they've increased their branches, their branch networks, whereas the smaller Small banks are being eliminated. They're being eaten up by the large ones because they—they're they, in the final analysis. We're 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 a uh, we're private sector. We're private organizations, and they you can't you, you can't provide the return to your investors because of all these compliance uh, costs. Um, but in terms of branches, we've also dropped uh, six percent. There, there, there was ninety-seven thousand branches in the country uh, ten years ago. There's ninety-one thousand heavier hit. On the U.S.-Mexico border. So again, the the, the banking, the the, the uh, access to to debt and to banking services continues to decline. Uh, it, it's a it's really a, a difficult case for uh, some banks to uh, to justify opening up additional branches along the along the border because of the the high um, cost to to for compliance. Hmm. And, uh, and and you just have to, you have to do that. I I will uh, yield the floor, and we'll continue right. as, as you as you indicated, so we could uh, get some questions and answers yep. going. But the, the but the bottom line is that the, that the U.S. Uh, Mexico banks are being unduly hurt in as much as the mm -hmm. compliance uh, concerns, because some of the other banks throughout the country don't don't have the scrutiny uh, that uh, that U.S. 
Mex the bank's located on the U.S.-Mexico border. Okay. Our, our bank, I think, is the only one chartered and headquartered on the U.S.-Mexico. Interesting. That's very interesting. And, and Leah, um, you know, representing the such a diverse uh, community, business community, small, medium uh, folks, uh, many of whom are on the border and depend on trade from Mexico, um, uh, clients who use Mexican credit cards and, uh, and, and pesos, uh, they may buy or sell product back forth across the border and their bank and services. So uh, how, have, what is your perspective though and, and on, on how that's impacted a lot of your, your customers and business in general in the border region? No, thank you, Russ. And I wanted to start by thanking IBC for their investment of resources. There obviously is a bank seeing that return on investment, I imagine, that makes it sense to do this. And I'm hoping more community banks uh, have that eye-opening experience and can, can invest and, and assist. It's been particularly challenging in Arizona. As Russ mentioned, our Chamber of Commerce is a little unusual in that we've built a network of affiliate chambers in some of the communities along the border, and we'll continue to grow that way. But over the last several years, we've heard story after story of uh, folks coming in and, and uh, going into their branch office or being contacted by their national or community bank and receiving a cashier's check for not only their business account depository amount, but also for their personal and tell, tell to find something else elsewhere because they're higher risk. That's from law firms to um, high, higher profile, more visible people in the community to very banks that have been or businesses that have been in place for generations uh, that have very good reputations in the community. Um, so just shocking experiences throughout, uh, I'd say Southern Arizona is really where we experience that. Um, we've also, as Hector kind of laid out the field, I won't repeat all that, but you've seen banks close, uh, branches close. The business lending environment is, is pretty much at a standstill along uh, the Southern Arizona border. Um, and there have been just particular challenges in growth. Our governor of Arizona, Governor Ducey, as well as President Obama, have talked about the importance of growing trade. How do we double trade to Mexico from Arizona's perspective? How do we do that from the U.S. perspective? Very hard to grow if you don't have capital. Uh, what we've seen in Arizona, if you've kind of looked at the lay of the land, how's it gone for the, the smaller business community, because primarily those of our members probably have 25 employees or fewer, so pretty much the small business community in Arizona. But uh, we've recovered from the economic recession. Things are getting better depending on the industry you're in. And some people are ready to invest and grow, but not able to find that capital. Uh, what we did a couple of years ago is worked with a few groups along the border to bring in the FDIC. Actually wrote a letter to the chairman of the FDIC saying, we're here representing small businesses on the border. Uh, we want you to be able to hear directly from them in terms of the impact. And they responded right away, which was really exciting. And they sent out a regional director, Stan Ivey, out to Nogales, which is right on the border. And uh, he came out and with a team of his folks to get stories and anecdotes from a lot of the business community. They've since had a follow-up meeting with the Arizona Bankers Association and other groups to, to hear more about what's going on. But it continues, uh, we, we receive information on the Bank Secrecy Act. We understand what's happening. We understand the investment that a uh, national or community bank would have to make in order to, to comply and, to, and take that additional risk. But we do think there are cases like IBC where that return on investment might be worthwhile for legitimate businesses that are doing things right and have had business uh, relationships for so long. Um, what's interesting from the FDIC perspective, and actually Senator Flake brought it to our attention maybe a, a year or so ago, was that the chairman of the FDIC had written a letter to all the, the bank CEOs and had questioned and said, why are you uh, not having financial relationships with entire industry classes. Let's take this on a case-by-case -case example. So we've had that same conversation from a small business perspective on case-by-case -case example. How does this work in this uh, regulatory environment? What does this mean? Um, the FDIC identified top concerns related to cross-border transactions as ACH transactions, as you can imagine, uh, foreign bank account reporting, big issue in terms of getting information and these gentlemen are probably experts that can talk to you more about that but we hear that how do you get information on a foreign entity um, is it the bank's responsibility to not only know you the customer but your customers customers you know where is that balance um, uh, declaring cross cross-border cash transactions if you can't borrow and you don't have and depository relationships are tough more and more of these transactions are becoming cash that's 
probably problematic when it comes to Bank Secrecy Act. And, and that's that limited. If, I think it's $10,000 both ways for Mexico or the U.S. in terms of how much in checks and cash you can take across Certainly, the border. Cer- time. Wire transactions, tightening up in that area. Um, but it, I think there's some work being done in the Arizona from the Arizona perspective on how to get information more readily available. Um, I was mentioning to Jose Luis an organization called the National Law Center in Arizona. It's national, but we've got Dr. Boris Kozalczyk, if any of you have heard of him. He's still there. Uh, And he has been starting uh, having a lot of conversations around letters of credit and how you can establish that with foreign entities. An opportunity, perhaps, for many of you out there that are in different states. we applaud Senator Flake and McCain, who really have been leading the effort, writing letters, trying to have uh, testimony done at the Senate Finance Committees, just engaging with the community. I talk to Senator Flake's staff quite often, actually, about things that I see and, and situations occurring. Um, the senators have had written a letter to the FDIC trying to address some of this, because at this point, it's from a small business perspective, it's been explained to us. I get it. But now I need solutions. My members are trying to grow now. You know, next month, I I don't want to wait for Congress to act. I want to have some kind of uh, financial solution at this point. Um, The senator's letters have talked about the fact that they believe it's an undue burden on the financial institutions in complying with the BSA, the Bank Secrecy Act. They want to see ongoing dialogue with the banks and their customers, the small businesses that are experiencing these challenges. They think there's a disconnect between the policy and the application. Seems like that's the case. We also need coordinated effort among the agencies. Um, And again, they pointed out the risk assessment by the banks of individual customers, not entire industry classes or an entire geographic location. Um, What we've done recently as a Chamber of Commerce, in partnership with our state chamber, the Arizona Chamber of Commerce and Industry, was actually take on the business lending piece. If it was hard to get funding, if perhaps we didn't have as strong a credit score now or we were in a a border community that that had a challenge getting lending, we have embraced fintech companies uh, or online lending companies, and there's an array of them, but we have partnered with two very credible fintech companies, Fundera and Credit Junction, and launched just recently ArizonaBizLoans.com. And this is an alternative lending source for those that can't get uh, loans, business loans, through our uh, national banks or credit unions. We send them there first because those are the best terms, the best rates. But if it doesn't work, come back to us and we'll work on alternative sources. So we've got about 30 lenders in our online portal now that are going to try and assist with that effort. That doesn't solve the depository issue because we certainly need that, but at least that's uh, for those businesses that are ready to grow, they can uh, attempt to get some short or long-term business loans. And I'll, I'll stop there, and we can answer questions later. Okay, great. That's a very interesting insight. And then um, I'll say, Luis, you you uh, you, you come on the Mex- you're on the Mexican. I read fairly recently that uh, although they're, you're not having de-risking going on in Mexico, it actually is a booming industry. But but there are fewer Mexican banks that have relationships with. U.S. banks in terms of exchange of, 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 of dollars and pesos. Uh, so I would, I would suspect that the Dodd-Frank and some of the regulatory requirements that are burdening U.S. banks in those transactions are migrating, unfortunately, and creating some, uh, some issues for Mexican banks. Uh, and also, uh, you know, y- y- the financial crisis when it occurred, which was the genesis for uh, 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 Dodd- uh, Dodd-Frank, um, how did it infect Mexico? Did, was it as, uh, as severe, or, or what, what adjustments did Mexico make? And what, what are your perspectives on how we might improve and restore the banking relationship while ensuring that we're not, uh, you're not vehicles for money laundering and other illicit activities? Sure. Well, thanks, Russ. Um, uh, first, I, I will address your question, but first I would like to thank the, the Woodrow Wilson Center. Mm-hmm. And also, uh, I would like to thank you, Ross, Hector, and Lia, for sharing this panel. It is very important that uh, in the context of the discussion of building a competitive border that we have included the panel on financial interconnection. During this morning, uh, the previous panelists have spoken about the the facts that show uh, the, the importance and the intensity of our borders. That uh, commerce, that trade that takes place in many ways uh, cannot function without uh, a proper financial interconnection. Uh, We have gone directly to address the issue on the risking. Mm -hmm. 
The risking, first of all, I would like to highlight is not only an issue between uh, the Mexico and the U.S. border. It is actually a global issue nowadays. Oh, okay. uh, and for those who are not familiar with the, the risking, I would only like to, to, to read out the definition that has been established by the Financial Action Task Force, which is the premier body on anti-money laundering. Mm. And the FATF has defined the risking as the phenomenon of financial institutions. And here I would like to make a parentheses and, and further uh, explain that this is not only financial institutions, but actually global institutions and mostly U.S. institutions are terminating or restricting relationships with clients or categories of clients to avoid rather than manage risk in line with the FATF risk-based approach. Mm. So this termination on an indiscriminately way is taking place at a global level and not only regarding MSBs, US MSBs, which are money service businesses in, in the border on the US side, and uh, financial institutions in Mexico, including banks. We are subject, we have been subject for the last at least three years to the risking in Mexico. Mm. Uh, actually, Mexico was perhaps the first country <coughs> to raise its hand vis-a-vis uh, -vis US authorities and financial institutions to express its concern on this matter. Uh, what are authorities on both sides of the country doing in order to address this issue? Many things. We have been working together, mainly on behalf of Treasury, the US Treasury, and the Mexican uh, Secretary of Finance to understand first which were the drivers of uh, the risking, the effects, and most importantly, which are some of the solutions. Uh, for that purpose, in the last three years, we have been meeting uh, on a regular basis in different working groups. Uh, some of them are only uh, formed by authorities of both countries. Others include the participation of representati representatives of the private sector, basically some of the largest uh, banks in both countries. Mm. And uh, out of the work of these groups, we have uh, identified which are uh, necessary measures to be taken, and we have been uh, implementing uh, many of them. Uh, I would like to provide a few examples. Uh, on the regulatory side, uh, both US and Mexico has, have identified that the, the first step is to uh, fully comply with the Financial Action Task Force International Standards. These are 40 recommendations, uh, which are quite comprehensive on anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing. Uh, Mexico is at a good standpoint in that regard. In 2014, the b international body, FATF, recognized that we were fully compliant with the key and core recommendations of the group. Uh, it issued new recommendations in 2014, and we are working uh, very uh, focused on uh, complying with the new uh, standards and also in, a, in the effectiveness of their implementation. Another agreement was uh, to try to homologate our uh, level of supervision. Mm. Uh, in the National Banking Securities Commission, which I, I represent, uh, we have been working very hard to transition into a risk-based supervision. What that means is that the supervisor is able to understand the risks of a given sector, a given financial institution, and assess if that given institution is mitigating its risks. So uh, the logic is that banks should not just uh, eliminate risk, but actually assess risk and then define if they are able to uh, carry out their business uh, without uh, raising this, uh, lowering the standards. Uh, this risk-based approach concept is basic in today's anti-money laundering efforts. And, and, it, and again, uh, that is why the risking is not acceptable because it is contrary to the risk-based approach uh, concept, which is analyzed on a case-by-case, -case, which is the risk of a given client and not uh, take arbitrary decisions based on perception of a given sector or country. 
and the linkage of that client to those two. Mm. Uh, third, uh, we have also worked in both sides of the countries to provide further guidance to the financial uh, sectors, mainly banks, on which are the expectations of the authority for their compliance of anti-money laundering uh, obligations. This is key because much of the confusion, much of what has uh, pushed uh, banks initially to the risk is a lack of understanding of, their, uh, of the expectation of authorities on, on their implementation of a risk-based analysis. And a uh, Last, we have also uh, worked very closely in operational cases for sending a message that those clients, I mean, don't, not those clients, but those financial institutions that do not carry out their obligations in the way they are expected to will be sanctioned. And those uh, criminals that use financial institutions for carrying out uh, money laundering or terrorist financing uh, transactions will be prosecuted. So. I give you the microphone so we can initiate the dialogue. Interesting. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I work as a customs broker with uh, a lot of uh, uh, binational or multinational companies that are operating in in Mexico and other parts of the world, and and um, and their their costs, uh, their operations, uh, money, large sums of money for payroll and and uh, other other services are are moving back and forth all over the world every day. Uh, between these, and the, and they don't seem to be having the same kind of issues with a de-risking that the small to medium-sized uh, businesses are having. So if you're a big if you're a big money mover uh, across international borders, you seem to be okay. So somehow in that definition of who's high risk and who's not, I guess they they must be okay. And so the an assumption that your small to medium-sized business is a is just kind of automatically a higher risk because it seems to me from what uh, Lee has been saying is it's, it's it's mainly affecting a lot of the border regions and the small to medium businesses and I'm not sure if that was the intent of Dodd-Frank. Uh, any thoughts on that? Uh, the, the intent of Dodd-Frank was completely the opposite. Uh, it, it it was really to rein in the larger banks, but what it's it's affected uh, Main Street versus Wall Street, and it's unfortunate because uh, the de-risking happens. It's it's happening, and and it's uh, uh, it, it, it's something where the business model of the, of the particular banks have elected to do that, and and it's it's unfortunate because some uh, whether it's it's de-risking on the in, uh, on the um, account level, mm -hmm. but some large institutions have done it on the bank branch level mm -hmm. and have eliminated areas where uh, rather than managing the risk, they just eliminate it in that, in that mm -hmm. fashion. So uh, it's an, the unintended consequence, which you mentioned earlier. Um, the, in as much as cash is concerned, there's, that's the big difference. If, you know, if there's a flow of funds through wire transfers, that's easily tracked whereas the cash is not. And, and really it affects the smaller, um, small and micro businesses that are operating that, that purchase inventory or sell to uh, individuals and small businesses on either side of the border. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and those are the ones that are affected. If you lose an account because of, uh, of de-risking, or if you lose an account because the unattended unintended consequences of, of structuring, which is also a key, key word where you try to avoid that, uh, those reporting requirements, that's immediately a, a suspicious activity, which, mm. which is a reportable activity. And, and, and I think we've, uh, the federal government has deputized banks, and we don't really care to carry a badge, quite frankly, <laughs> and it's deputized the banks to, to, to report suspicious activities. So, so you're elected sheriff and didn't want to be. We didn't want to be, that's right. <laughs> we're we're uh, uh, breathing gills uh, oxygen, and we <laughs> certainly don't want to do that. So mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the issue has been that it's uh, with the de-risking and, and small customers losing their accounts, then it drives them mm -hmm. Uh, to other sources to conduct their uh, banking activities, which it's either going to be um, 
uh, un unacceptable because it, it, it may be illegal mm -hmm. or, or very, very expensive. And as much as those, the fintech companies, I'm, I have absolutely no idea how they can comply with the Community Reinvestment Act. Uh, and, and as a community bank, they're not going to be involved with the local uh, baseball team and the local school. Right. And, and, and it's just, a, it's, it's a, I understand that, that uh, change occurs and we need to be open to change. And the one, uh, uh, he who, who succeeds is who, he who can adapt to change. Uh, that's absolutely correct. So I don't know how the, the FinTech really comes into that particular uh, equation. But some folks will have to uh, move in, into an alternative direction hmm. if uh, if those communities don't have bank accounts or banks for that matter. Well, you, you raised something I want to follow up on that is is that uh, since Dodd Frank was passed a number of years ago, was it six years, seven years ago, something like six that? Six years ago. Okay. There's been three de novo. De novo is new banks banks created in the entire United States because Dodd-Frank required because they were concerned of these big banks that were too big to, you know, fail about their levels of capitalization. So they just kind of cookie cuttered the requirements. And so those same capitalization requirements apply if you want to start a community bank. So at the very, it's kind of like a perfect storm. So as the larger institutions, because they are so structured, are de-risking because they feel they have an unusual amount of exposure because they are, they have branches everywhere. <clears throat> Yet the communities on the border, and I and I started up I I started up at the Novo Bank about 15 years ago on the border. It's doing quite well today, but I'm working with another group trying to help them start up another bank, and um, the amount of capitalization is like four to five times as much as it was when we started up the. The first one I was involved with, so it's kind of a it's it's a catch twenty two. You got the big banks closing, and you can't form a small bank that that where it's a community bank like you uh, like to, to think of yourselves as a regional bank, but more of a community based bank. So how do we how do we solve that? I think we look at innovative approaches. I mean, we we did the same thing from an Arizona perspective. Thought if if there's nobody serving this market that is. The fastest growing business sector in the United States are Latino-owned businesses, and even more specifically, Latina-owned businesses. Mm -hmm. So if nobody's servicing this sector, should we form a community bank? Should we look at credit unions? How does that work? And obviously, what, what was easiest for us to do was partner with FinTech, which you're right. That's a national platform. We're not going to see them probably sponsoring our local baseball team and things like that. But they were hungry for the business. I also believe the same dot frank rules don't apply to FinTech. So that's certainly something Congress is looking at. Um, we also looked at crowdfunding in the state of Arizona. Equity crowdfunding has become uh, something that we're embracing. Don't know if that will work or how does that. But couldn't crowdfunding be uh, utilized by money launderers? Who knows? I mean, it's There'll pretty much unregulated. On that too, you know? I'm sure. So, <laughs> but we looked at all these different innovative approaches to find out what what could service us now as we try to grow. Um, and I had a question, if I'm allowed to ask. Sure. <laughs> if I so, question for you, Jose Luis. Um, because the U.S. banks have relationships with the Mexican banks, isn't it Wells Fargo and Santander or something like that? Uh, why why isn't there a sharing of information between the banks? It seems like a, the crux of a lot of the issue is um, needing information on businesses that do business in pesos and dollars. How does that work? Well, there is actually plenty of sharing of information. Uh, this was one of the uh, gaps that we identified uh, within our bilateral groups, and that is that U.S. banks, when wanting to carry out uh, due diligence of their Mexican financial institutions' clients, or actually the clients of their financial institution clients. That is what Hector was mentioning before as know your customer's customer. Uh, they had little access or they had no access actually to that information. They could ask for the bank, the Mexican bank or other financial institution for the information on that bank, but they couldn't ask for information on their clients. Although this is not an expectation in terms of international standards, nor in terms of U.S. Uh, regulation. It is a reality, and that is that U.S. banks want uh, to carry such a comprehensive assessment of their Mexican and other country clients that uh, they want to go into 
further detail. So what we did was to amend the uh, regulation uh, on AML CFT applicable to Mexican banks in order to allow them uh, to share information with foreign banks, not only U.S. ones, mm -hmm. although, of course, in practice it will be mainly U.S. ones, but to share information with foreign banks when uh, on their clients when dealing strictly with AML CFT issues. Mm -hmm. But wasn't I mean, as I recall, there was a NAFTA banking component, you know, to NAFTA. Did didn't any of that ever actually happen? Like just like NAFTA trucking. Um, this was not considered NAFTA. No. This was a prohibition actually in Mexican mm -hmm. law due to data privacy issues, mm -hmm. and it was opened until late 2014. We are working in making its implementation as effective as okay. possible, and this, uh, well gives the possibility to U.S. banks to carry out uh, a due diligence in the terms they wish to. Mm -hmm. And this should end any excuse mm -hmm. for U.S. banks or any other bank not to carry a risk-based approach on each client. That's great. Excellent. Well, that's very good. I was listening to the customs in the discussion earlier about the ACE and the single window for uh, international commercial transactions to pay, take place, and you wonder, so why aren't we doing kind of an ACE for, uh, for financial transactions so that uh, this can be more fluid in the exchange and sharing of information for, you know, on a voluntary basis for legitimate businesses to allow for their banking information to be shared and that kind of collaboration. Is there any, any institutional discussions between the U.S. and Mexico on trying to collaborate more on that. I'm, I applaud Mexico for making the changes to their regulatory regime to accommodate our needs. That's great. I appreciate it very much for your country. We have been talking about taking innovative actions throughout the day, and one that hasn't been discussed fully. Uh, it's a simple one, but it's an important one, and that is uh, to create trust among further trust among authorities and institutions credibility. Uh, and we have different ideas in that regard. Uh, we want to do joint supervision with the OCC, the Fed, any other relevant agency in the US. Uh, we, we have kindly requested our counterparts to be able to access their examiners to explain how the financial system in Mexico is integrated, which is the level of regulation and supervision in the country. Uh, we are also uh, developing very direct, simple, but complete uh, templates, which explain uh, how each of our financial sectors, we have 19, mm -hmm. is conformed, which is the level of authorization or registration, uh, the type of operations they can do, their regulation, specific regulation on AML CFT, and the purpose is to uh, handle that information to FinCEN or some other authority. FinCEN is the financial intelligence unit in the U.S. Mm -hmm. so that they can disseminate that information to the U.S. financial system and they have more elements to understand which are the institutions in Mexico, what they do, and when they uh, receive the report on a transaction that says, I don't know, SOFOM, which is a type of financial institution, uh, they don't put the face of what? so that they actually know uh, what is meant by that financial institution mm -hmm. and the level of, again, regulation and supervision. Mm -hmm. Another initiative that we're thinking on doing is to uh, create a, a web page to which uh, financial institutions in the U.S. can access with uh, code uh, and o in order to uh, have all uh, uh, basic information on each uh, bank in Mexico. Mm -hmm their anti-money laundering procedures, the information on their uh, compliance officer, uh, and so on. So that uh, this communication and this uh, the perception of how we're doing things in Mexico, which is quite seriously, uh, can be permitted to a broader uh, auditorium. Oh, that's, uh, that's very exciting, very encouraging. Uh, I applaud uh, uh, you and your uh, colleagues for uh, the, all of the uh, proactive uh, um, uh, changes and, and con contemplating uh, other ones. It's great. And on behalf of, uh, as chairman of BTA, I invite both of you to join Hector in our uh, border banking task force so we can uh, 
uh, further and keep the information flowing uh, uh, and the encouraging news actually in some in this case uh, to some of the folks that are very frustrated and and uh, you know communities that are down to one branch bank no community bank just one little branch bank and uh, otherwise have to drive miles and miles uh, to do their banking. So um, I want to thank all three of you. It's been great. Uh, I've learned a lot. I don't know about the everybody out in the audience, but this has been excellent. We have a few minutes for a couple of questions. And so if anyone does have a question, if you would, uh, you can direct it to the group or any one of the individuals on the uh, on the panel. Um, I see a hand right there. Thank you. Uh, my name is Patricia Escamilla Ham, and I am a professor and researcher here in DC. Um, you all, all the three of you, uh, talked about the regulations uh, against money laundering and the impact of those regulations on the banking uh, system and um, the users of the banking system. Uh, at the border. So my question is, uh, to what extent are these regulations actually being effective uh, in terms of uh, the U.S. and Mexico? Uh, are they really, uh, you know, detecting and fighting money laundering? Thank you. I, I think that's an excellent question because I sometimes wonder my, myself because the businesses, the illicit businesses seem to be uh, still operating, so uh, you wonder whether uh, how how effective that that is. But um, but I'd I'd rather turn that over to uh, to Jose Luis and, and and Hector. They have a lot more knowledge than I would about uh, just how effective they think these uh, regulations have been. Okay, I'll. Um, that's a actually that's an excellent question because we question that ourselves, and I'll give you. A, a, I've got some statistics here on it's 2014 filings uh, in in Houston Harris County there were 22,889 uh, suspicious activity reports filed I'm not going to bore you with all the details but 16,000 in Dallas 11,000 in in Plano which is basically Dallas 6,800 in in, uh, in Bear County and so on and so on we don't get feedback. We don't know if all this information that we give to the federal government is utilized. You see information in the papers and you'll see high profile um, responses on, 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 on raids and that kind of thing, but we don't get a feedback if the suspicious activity report that we file is ever acted upon. Hmm. I would imagine, I would just imagine that they work on the bigger ones and some of the smaller ones just uh, die on the vine. Hmm. But it's, uh, it, in as much as that is, is concerned, I can uh, assure you that we don't get any feedback. So as a, as a banker, we do all this work. We spend literally millions of dollars to comply and to make sure that, uh, uh, that we do respond in a timely manner, yet we don't get any feedback. You know, I would, I'd be, I'm tempted to ask Jose Luis, but uh, since he's uh, from the other side, I don't know if you want to make a quick comment before we I wrap can, this up. I can do it because it's pretty much the same on both sides of the country. And I think this is an area in which uh, authorities from both the U.S. and Mexico have to do a better job. Uh, we have to provide uh, further feedback, first of all, to the financial institutions that are doing good, uh, an important part of the job and also to the general public. Uh, to, to Hector's comment, I can affirm that the information that is received uh, by banks is, is crucial for the work of AML authorities, both uh, for specific cases and for strategic studies that allow us to identify typologies and therefore uh, do a better job in preventing money laundering and combating once it, is, it has been executed. But at the end, the role that it regulated entities, banks, and other financial institutions and non-financial uh, institutions is key. And the fact that they have strict controls is already important, even, e even if in, 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 in the case that authorities would do nothing with that information, which is not what happens. But even if that was the case, 
Uh, the fact that financial institutions have such strict controls is dissuasive to criminal activity for the financial system. Okay, well, thank you very much. And uh, please join me in uh, thanking our panel. Uh, we've run out of time. Actually, we're a little bit beyond there. Thank you very much. Great job. Thanks again to our, our panelists and to Russ for moderating that panel. We're going to move right into our, our next panel, which is facilitating trade and travel, improving infrastructure and processes at our ports of entry. And so I invite the panelists and the moderator, Eric Lee, to, to come to the stage.